Here are nursing practice questions that may help you. This is from 11 to 20. The nurse is caring for a client receiving mechanical ventilation. The ventilator begins alarming and displays an alert about low tidal volumes. The nurse checks the endotracheal tube and ventilator tubing but does not find any obvious cause of the alarm. The client's oxygen saturation is decreasing. What should the nurse do next? 1. Call the respiratory therapist to the bedside to troubleshoot the ventilator. 2. Elevate the head of the bed and apply a non-rebreather mask. 3. Increase the oxygen delivery setting on the ventilator to 100%. 4. Manually ventilate with a bag valve mask resuscitator attached to the endotracheal tube. Correct answer. A low tidal volume alarm indicates that the volume of air being delivering by the ventilator is lower than the set volume. This is often due to a disconnection, loose connection, or leak in the ventilator circuit, e.g., tubing. Other causes include changes in the client's breathing efforts or leaking of air around the cuff of the endotracheal tube, ETT. The nurse should first troubleshoot common causes of the alarm but if the client is showing signs of inadequate oxygenation. The ventilator should be disconnected to allow manual ventilation with a bag valve mask, BVM, resuscitator connected to high flow oxygen, 15 L per minute, option 4. Option 1, respiratory therapists collaborate with nurses and have specialized training in mechanical ventilators. They should be called to the bedside, but the nurse should first begin stabilizing the client. Option 2, the inflated cuff of the ETT creates a seal against the walls of the trachea that ensures air movement is controlled through the tube, instead of passing around the tube. The inflated cuff also prevents aspiration of secretions or gastric contents into the lungs. A non-rebreather mask is ineffective in this case because air delivered through the nares and oropharynx cannot pass around the ETT cuff to reach the lungs. Option 3, the client would benefit from a higher oxygen concentration. However, changing this setting on the ventilator does not guarantee increased oxygen delivery to the client when the set volume of air is not being delivered. The client must be manually ventilated with a BVM resuscitator connected to supplemental oxygen. Educational Objective Ventilators will alarm when set parameters are not being met, e.g. Low tidal volumes. These alarms may indicate a change in client condition or ventilator malfunction. The nurse should manually ventilate the client with a bag valve mask resuscitator if an alarm cannot be quickly resolved and the client shows signs of respiratory distress. The nurse is caring for an 11-month-old child in the pediatric hospital. Which of these child's findings would be a common criterion to activate the rapid response team? Select all that apply. 1. New onset right-sided paralysis of extremities. 2. Pulse rate sustained at 120 per minute. 3. Respirations continued at 38 per minute. 4. Sudden inability to be aroused to an awake state. 5. Temperature of 101.3 F, 38.5 C. Correct answer. Rapid response teams are formed as a means to get critical care specialists to the bedside of clients who are not in a critical care unit when acute, significant changes occur in their condition. Each institution sets its own criteria, but it usually includes acute changes in heart rate, systolic blood pressure, respiratory rate, oxygen saturation, level of consciousness, and or urine output. Although strokes occur more commonly in adults, they can occur in children. Symptoms found in both groups can be similar, such as unilateral paralysis, which is usually found with vessel abnormalities or a hematologic complication, e.g., sickle cell, cancer, option 1. Just as in adults, emergency treatment for children should be activated. A sudden loss of consciousness is emergent in any client, option 4. Option 2, normal heart rate for an infant, 1 to 12 months, is 100 to 160 per minute. Option 3, normal respiration rate for an infant, 1 to 12 months, is 30 to 60 per minute. Option 5, 
A fever is ordinarily not an emergency situation that meets the criteria to activate the rapid response team. It can signal a serious condition in infants who are age less than one month or in children age less than two years who have a temperature greater than 104 F, 40 C, without a localized source, due to an immature immune system. However, in this case, it would probably be more effective to call a healthcare provider to prescribe appropriate diagnostic tests, e.g., complete blood count, cultures, and treatment, e.g., antibiotics. A fever does not usually require immediate life-saving intervention. Educational Objective Rapid response teams are formed as a means to get critical care assistance to the bedside of clients, not in intensive care, with acute significant changes in their condition. Common criteria include sudden, significant changes in pulse rate, respiration rate, systolic blood pressure, oxygen saturation, level of consciousness, and or urine output. The emergency department nurse is caring for a client who requires gastric lavage for a drug overdose. Which action would be appropriate? 1. Lavage through a small bore nasogastric tube. 2. Place client in Trendelenburg position during lavage. 3. Prepare intubation and suction supplies at the bedside. 4. Wait an hour after gastric decompression to initiate lavage. Correct answer. Gastric lavage, GL, is performed through an orogastric tube to remove ingested toxins and irrigate the stomach. GL is rarely performed as it is associated with a high risk of complications, e.g. aspiration, esophageal or gastric perforation, dysrhythmias. GL is only indicated if the overdose is potentially lethal and if GL can be initiated within one hour of the overdose. Activated charcoal administration is the standard treatment for overdose, but it is ineffective for some drugs, e.g., lithium, iron, alcohol. Intubation and suction supplies should always be available at the bedside during GL in case the client develops aspiration or respiratory distress, option 3. Option 1. GL is usually performed through a large bore, 36 to 42 French, or a gastric tube so that a large volume of water or saline can be instilled in and out of the tube. Option 2, during GL. Clients should be placed on their side or with the head of bed elevated to minimize aspiration risk. Option 4, GL should be initiated within one hour of overdose ingestion to be effective. The client's stomach should be decompressed first, but lavage should be initiated as soon as possible afterwards. Educational Objective Gastric lavage is used to remove ingested toxins and irrigate the stomach after a drug overdose. It should be initiated within one hour of overdose. The nurse should position the client to prevent aspiration and have emergency respiratory equipment at the bedside. The charge nurse is evaluating the skills of graduate nurses, GN, who are caring for clients with shock. Which action taken by a GN indicates a need for further education? 1. Administers furosemide to a client with elevated pulmonary artery wedge pressure in cardiogenic shock. 2. Applies an SpO2 sensor to the forehead of a client with septic shock rather than using a finger. 3. Raises the head of the bed to high fowler position for a client with hypovolemic shock. 4. Titrates norepinephrine infusion to maintain mean arterial pressure 265 mm Hg in a client with anaphylactic shock. Correct answer. Hypovolemic shock occurs when there is inadequate circulating volume to maintain perfusion due to hemorrhage, decreased fluid intake, or fluid loss, e.g., vomiting, diarrhea, diuresis. Care of the client with shock includes restoring circulation, e.g., IV fluids. Positioning for a client with hypovolemic shock involves elevating the legs and maintaining the head of bed, hob, is less than or equal to 30 degrees. This allows gravity to assist with venous return, cardiac output, and perfusion of vital organs, e.g., brain, kidney, Raising the hob greater than 30 degrees, e.g. 
High Fowler position, seated upright, is inappropriate in a client with hypovolemic shock and inadequate circulating vascular volume. Option 3. Option 1. Elevated pulmonary artery wedge pressure, normal. 6 to 12 mm Hg, is a manifestation of cardiogenic shock. Diuretics, e.g. Furosemide, are appropriate for cardiogenic shock because decreasing left ventricular preload reduces cardiac workload. Option 2. Placing the SpO2 sensor on the forehead rather than the finger can provide more accurate readings in clients with decreased peripheral tissue perfusion, e.g., shock, vasopressor therapy. Option 4. Norepinephrine is a vasopressor used to increase stroke volume, cardiac output, and mean arterial pressure, MAP. Norepinephrine should be titrated to maintain MAP 265 mm Hg for a client in shock, e.g., anaphylactic. Educational Objective Positioning for a client with hypovolemic shock involves elevating the legs and maintaining the head of bed is less than or equal to 30 degrees to allow gravity to assist with venous return and increase cardiac output and perfusion. The nurse is caring for a client who is one day postoperative extensive abdominal surgery for ovarian cancer. The client is receiving IV ringers lactate at 100 milliliters per hour and continual epidural morphine for pain control. The Foley catheter urine output has decreased to less than 20 milliliters per hour over the past two hours. The postoperative hematocrit is 36%, 0.36, and the hemoglobin is 12 grams per deciliter, 120 grams per liter. Which action should the nurse carry out first? One. Assess vital signs. 2. Increase the IV rate to 125 milliliters per hour. 3. Notify the healthcare provider. 4. Perform a bladder scan. Correct answer. Third spacing of fluids can occur 24 to 72 hours after extensive abdominal surgery as a result of increased capillary permeability due to tissue trauma. It occurs when too much fluid moves from the intravascular into the interstitial or third space, a place between cells where fluid does not normally collect, i.e., injured site, peritoneal cavity. This fluid serves no physiologic purpose, cannot be measured, and leads to decreased circulating volume, hypovolemia, and cardiac output. The priority intervention is to assess vital signs as the manifestations associated with third spacing include weight gain, decreased urinary output, and signs of hypovolemia, such as tachycardia and hypotension. If third spacing is not recognized and corrected early on, postoperative hypotension can lead to decreased renal perfusion, prerenal failure, and hypovolemic shock, option 1. Option 2. Increasing the IV flow rate of the isotonic solution may be an appropriate intervention once the nurse has assessed the client, including taking a full set of vital signs. The nurse should intervene only after assessing to rule out other problems for which an increase in IV fluid intake would not be an appropriate solution, e.g., Foley catheter obstruction. Option 3. The nurse will notify the healthcare provider to report oliguria less than 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour, after collecting all of the data necessary, i.e., vital signs. This is not the nurse's first action. Option 4. Urinary retention is possible following surgery due to the adverse effects of anesthesia, opioids, anticholinergic drugs, and immobility. However, a bladder scan is not an appropriate action in this situation as the client has a Foley catheter. Irrigating the catheter is the appropriate intervention if the nurse questions its patency. Educational Objective Third spacing can occur following extensive abdominal surgery and can lead to hypovolemia, decreased cardiac output, hypotension and tachycardia, and decreased urine output. Monitoring vital signs and urine output and maintaining IV fluids are appropriate interventions to prevent prerenal failure and hypovolemic shock. The nurse is caring for a client with sepsis and acute respiratory failure who was intubated and prescribed mechanical ventilation three days ago. 
the nurse assesses for which adverse effect associated with the administration of positive pressure ventilation, PPV. 1. Dehydration. 2. Hypokalemia. 3. Hypotension. 4. Increased cardiac output. Correct answer. Positive pressure ventilation, PP, delivers positive pressure to the lungs using a mechanical ventilator, MV. Either invasively through a tracheostomy or endotracheal tube or non-invasively through a nasal mask, face mask, nasal prongs, or a mouthpiece. The most common type used in the acute care setting for clients with acute respiratory failure is the volume-cycled positive pressure MV, which delivers a preset volume and concentration of oxygen, e.g., 21% to 100%, with varying pressure. Positive pressure applied to the lungs compresses the thoracic vessels and increases intrathoracic pressure during inspiration. This leads to reduced venous return, ventricular preload, and cardiac output, which results in hypotension. The hypotensive effect of PP is even greater in the presence of hypovolemia, e.g., hemorrhage, hypovolemic shock, and decreased venous tone, e.g., septic shock, neurogenic shock. Option 1. Fluid and or sodium retention usually occurs about 48 to 72 hours after initiation of PP due to 1. Increased intrathoracic pressure and decreased cardiac output that stimulate the kidneys to release renin. 2. Physiologic stress that leads to the release of antidiuretic hormone and cortisol. And 3. Breathing through the ventilator's closed circuitry, which decreases insensible loss associated with respiration. Option 2. Hypokalemia is not associated with PPV. Option 4. PP increases intrathoracic pressure and reduces venous return to the right side of the heart, reducing preload and cardiac output as well. Educational Objective. Positive pressure ventilation causes increased intrathoracic pressure and reduced venous return and cardiac output, which can result in hypotension. The emergency department nurse receives a client with extensive injuries to the head and upper back. The nurse will perform what action to allow the best visualization of the airway? 1. Head tilt chin lift in the supine position on a backboard. 2. Head tilt chin lift in the Trendelenburg position. 3. Jaw thrust maneuver in semi Fowler's position. 4. Jaw thrust maneuver in the supine position on a backboard. Correct answer. Clinical situations involving trauma should follow ABC. Airway, breathing, and circulation. Airway assessment is particularly critical in clients with injuries to the head, neck, and upper back. Injury to the upper back should be treated as spinal trauma until the client has been cleared by an advanced trauma life support qualified healthcare provider. Until the spine is appropriately assessed, the client should be placed on a backboard and stabilized. The nurse should use the jaw thrust maneuver to avoid movement of an unstable spine. One provider should stabilize the cervical vertebra allowing the second provider to articulate the jaw independently of the spinal column. Option 1. Although use of the backboard is appropriate. The head tilt chin lift should not be used as it involves manipulation of the neck without proper stabilization. If the cervical vertebrae are fractured, the spinal cord could be badly damaged. Option 2. The head tilt chin lift does not stabilize the alignment of the head and neck and can cause spinal cord damage. In addition, the Trendelenburg position causes the abdominal organs to shift toward the diaphragm, which increases the work of breathing. Option 3, the jaw thrust maneuver is appropriate, but stabilization of the spine is best performed in the supine position, such as on the flat, hard surface of a backboard. Educational objective, if there is any suspicion of spinal injury, the jaw thrust maneuver should be used for airway assessment to avoid any shifting of unstable vertebrae and subsequent spinal cord damage. The nurse is caring for an intubated client whose oxygen saturation begins to drop. What action should the nurse take first? 1. Auscultate lung sounds bilaterally. 2. Hyperoxygenate with 100% oxygen. 3. 
Manually ventilate with bag valve mask. 4. Suction the endotracheal tube. Correct answer. A drop in oxygen saturation signifies a problem with ventilation. When an artificial airway is present, the nurse should assess the client to determine the cause of hypoventilation. Auscultating lung sounds is the first step and quickest intervention to confirm proper tube placement. It is not uncommon for the tube to become displaced in the hypopharynx, which would not allow proper ventilation. Another important complication is pneumothorax, which can cause hypotension and a drop in oxygen saturation. Lung auscultation would help diagnose this as well. Option 2, hyperoxygenating would not increase ventilation if the tube is not in proper position or if the client has a pneumothorax. Option 3, the first step is to confirm tube placement. Manually ventilating through a displaced tube would produce no better results than use of the ventilator. Option 4, mucus plugs are a common cause of decreased oxygen saturation in the intubated client. There are, however, specific symptoms associated with this problem, including secretions backing up in the tube and high-pressure ventilator alarms. Although this client may still need suctioning even if these symptoms are not present, auscultating lung sounds is necessary to confirm tube placement before suctioning. Suctioning via a displaced tube could cause additional damage to the client's airway. Educational Objective Proper placement of the endotracheal tube is essential for adequate ventilation in intubated clients. If the tube becomes displaced in the hypopharynx, hypoxemia can result. Confirming the presence of equal breath sounds bilaterally via auscultation is an important initial nursing intervention. The intensive care nurse is caring for a client who has just been extubated. Which interventions are appropriate at this time? Select all that apply. 1. Administer prescribed oral narcotics for throat pain. 2. Administer warmed, humidified oxygen via face mask. 3. Give the client ice chips to moisten the mouth. 4. Provide mouth care with oral sponges. 5. Start the client on incentive spirometer. Correct answer. Recently extubated clients are at high risk for aspiration, airway obstruction, laryngeal edema and or spasm, and respiratory distress. To prevent complications, clients are placed in high fowler position to maximize lung expansion and prevent aspiration of secretions. Warmed, humidified oxygen is administered immediately after extubation to provide high concentrations of supplemental oxygen without drying out the mucosa, option 2. Oral care is provided to decrease bacteria and contaminants as well as promote comfort, option 4. Clients are instructed to frequently cough, deep breathe, and use an incentive spirometer to expand alveoli and prevent atelectasis, option 5. Options 1 and 3, clients are kept NPO after extubation to prevent aspiration. They may have either a bedside swallow screen or a more formal swallow evaluation by a speech therapist prior to swallowing any food, drink, or medication. Educational Objective Recently extubated clients are immediately placed on humidified oxygen and monitored for aspiration, airway obstruction, and respiratory distress. Clients should remain no until swallowing function has been evaluated. In addition, clients should be given routine oral care as well as instructions on coughing, deep breathing, and use of incentive spirometry. A client is brought to the emergency department after his face slammed into a brick wall during a gang fight. Which client assessment finding is most important for the nurse to consider before inserting a nasogastric tube? 1. An echomotic area on the forehead. 2. Frontal headache rated as 10 on a 1 to 10 scale. 3. Nasal drainage NPO until swallowing function has been evaluated. In addition, clients should be given routine oral care as well as instructions on coughing, deep breathing, and use of incentive spirometry. A client is brought to the emergency department after his face slammed into a brick wall during a gang fight. 
Which client assessment finding is most important for the nurse to consider before inserting a nasogastric tube? 1. An echomotic area on the forehead. 2. Frontal headache rated as 10 on a 1 to 10 scale. 3. Nasal drainage on gauze has a red spot surrounded by serous fluid. 4. Small amount of bright red blood oozing from cheek laceration. Correct answer. Cerebrospinal fluid, CS, rhinorrhea, or CSF otorrhea, can confirm that a skull fracture has occurred and transverse the dura. If the drainage is clear, dextrose testing can determine if it is CSF. However, the presence of blood would make this test unreliable as blood also contains glucose. In this case, the halo ring test should be performed by adding a few drops of the blood-tinged fluid to gauze and assessing for the characteristic pattern of coagulated blood surrounded by CSF. Identification of this pattern is very important as CS leakage places the client at risk for infection. The client's nose should not be packed. No nasogastric or oral gastric tube should be inserted blindly when a basilar skull fracture is suspected as there is a risk of penetrating the skull through the fracture site and having the tube ascend into the brain. These tubes are placed under fluoroscopic guidance in clients with such fractures. Option 1. A bruise is an expected finding after direct trauma. It would be a concern if the echemosis were around the eyes, periorbital, raccoon eyes, or postericular. Bottle sign as this generally indicates a basilar skull fracture, a tear in the dura, and a potential CSF leak. Option 2. A headache is an expected finding after trauma. It would be a concern if it were unrelieved by non-narcotic analgesics or accompanied by signs of increased intracranial pressure. Option 4. The head is highly vascular and it is not unusual to have blood oozing after trauma. This is not as concerning as a potential CSF leak. However, it can become a problem if the nurse is unable to eventually stop the bleeding as substantial total blood loss is a concern. Educational Objective a nasogastric tube should not be inserted when a basilar skull fracture is suspected. CSF leakage is an indication of this and can be evidenced by a positive halo ring test of the blood-tinged nasal drainage, coagulated blood surrounded by CSF.